Okay, yeah, I guess we can begin. Um, I hope uh, that everybody can hear me and uh, see the screen. Uh, during the presentation, yeah, if you have questions or you want to interrupt or something, just uh, go ahead and then we can stop. Uh, let's begin. So, drop an octave. Uh, reducing spatial redundancy in convolutional neural networks with octave convolution. So, what is this paper about? This paper is about using a special new form of convolution that uh, focuses on more low frequency features uh, in convolutional neural networks, and that results in um, lower memory consumption and proof accuracy. Uh, more. So the outline is, um, first we'll introduce the problem as usual. I will go a little bit about uh, previous work and previous papers that have writ been written about this subject. Then the methods where we will go a bit deeper into how they do the convolution. Uh, and then discuss a bit the results in the conclusion. Normal. Uh, to start, so CNNs are very successful, we all know that. Um, and several architectures have been developed to increase the accuracy and to reduce the redundancy in uh, the calculations. Uh, this paper proposes basically a new form of convolution to handle spatial redundancy in the feature maps. So the easiest way to think about this, this is a bit like image compression. So we have an image that we see here on the right with uh, the penguins. And basically the features are high frequency features and low frequency features. Um, and now this is all done with the same convolution, which makes us use a lot, a lot of memory, which we don't really have to use because the features can actually be a bit less granular. So this is a bit, the idea is a bit similar to image compression that actually all these adjacent pixels will actually give us the same information and we can use a compressed form basically to uh, get our features out of it. Um, so this is the basic outline and the basic idea. Uh, how the paper structures it is that it's divided into low frequency and high frequency structures. Low frequency is the things that you don't need every pixel for instance, uh, and high frequency requires every pixel or more lower granularity. Uh, as I said already, so what they do, they propose an octave convolution, uh, which will use basically low frequency uh, features. And that results in lower memory and computational cost because you're basically just storing less data. Uh, the convolution that they propose is plug and play into any convolutional neural network. So that's really nice. Uh, and also because you enlarge the receptive um, you can improve their recognition performance, which is actually a very interesting result of this paper. What has been done before for this is that actually, yeah, many, many, many uh, topologies have been developed. So we have uh, the shortcut connections, for instance, to reduce the redundancy, uh, inter-channel connectivity, you can use stepwise convolutions. Uh, so many, many other things have been proposed. It's all, it's not that important for this paper. The, important part is that spatial redundancy has never been addressed in all these previous architectures. But it's actually quite interesting to explore this and that's why they do it in this paper. Um, what is also important is multi-scale representation because this is basically the approach that the paper uses is very similar to this. So multi-scale representation is that we um, basically make the same thing. So we have a low and a high frequency and we look for features that are present in both low and high frequency um, feature maps, which we use uh, low and high frequency kernels, because then that means that they're scale invariant, these features are supposed to be better. So the methodology of this paper is very similar to this, uh, but the goal is very different because the goal here is to reduce memory consumption, and for the other ones, the goal is to find scale invariant features. Um, and there has also been some work because uh, done for this, that they say, for instance, make several branches, but I guess it just increases the memory consumption. Um, and then, yeah, the, the, the pyramid feature representation, which is also very similar. So all the previous ones, what they just do is they make basically several uh, CNNs and they sort of take them together or they try to extract scale invariant features. Um, so the methodology will, will be very similar in this paper, but the goal is very, very 
how they do this octave convolution is um, they say, okay, we can factorize our image actually in the low frequency and a high frequency part, as we discussed before. Um, and then we can uh, define this whole octave part of it as um, we uh, divide the dimensions by power of two. So now we have 2D convolution. So we do two to the first. So our memory consumption goes divided by four, of course. Um, so if we do that a bit, let's say we have uh, our tensor with our normal input. So everything normal here, height width, our number of channels. What we're going to do with this tensor is we're going to split it in a high and a low dimensional part. Uh, I think this is also pretty trivial. Again, uh, if you have questions or something is unclear, just uh, stop me and then uh, I will do, uh, explain it a bit more. So we have our high one, which is the same as the normal one. So the resolution is the same. And here the resolution is divided by four. So half of the height, half of the width. Our alpha uh, controls the ratio between low and high frequency. I think this is all pretty trivial. Uh, and then the convolution itself. So we have our octave. So we have this representation now. We have it split. That's really, really nice. Um, to do this convolution, we have to go a little bit over uh, vanilla convolution. So a normal convolution. So we have this. This is our normal kernel. All very, very normal. This is our input and output tensors. So you see that we have no padding here. And the dimensionality of in and output is the same. It's just, it just makes it a bit easier for the calculations. Uh, and then this is our kernel, this is our input tensor, this is all normal vanilla convolution. So we start from this, and now we have to make a different form of convolution that can handle uh, this low and high frequency representation. So, yeah, the high and low frequency, we have to process them in a bit more complicated way than the normal one. So what we have, we have our high and our low parts. And we need to transform the ones from our low frequency part. This dimensionality, we need to make sure that this can be put back into the high dimensional, the, the high frequency one, and the other way around. So what we need for our output uh, tensor is we need this one, the low frequency one, where we have a normal vanilla convolution. This is simple. We already know how to do this. And we need to go from this uh, high to low, so from high frequency to low frequency, and vice versa. For this, we need to define our kernels a little bit different. So we have high and low, like usual, uh, where we can do the normal kernel. This is also a normal kernel, of course, for the low frequency part. And these are our special kernels that we will need to work out to make sure that we can get the proper dimensionality here on both sides. So in this figure, you can see it that we have these, the green ones are just vanilla convolutions. Uh, for this one, of course, we have to do some sort of pooling or some downsampling because the dimensionality of the high frequency is higher than the low one, of course. So we need to reduce the dimensionality. And for the low frequency, of course, we need to do the other way around. So we need to do some sort of uh, upsample here. OK, how are we going to do this? Uh, let's say this one already figured out, right? These are just vanilla convolutions. And for this one, we need to do our sampling again. So up or down sampling, uh, depending on which one it is. Uh, so what this becomes is this one is just, this is our vanilla convolution. We know this already. And then this uh, is the, um, going from the low to the high one. I put in red the important part because this is actually where the magic of the paper happens. Let's say. This is the most important part is that we just hear how we take the floor, right? So from low to high, then we, this is our upsampling that we do. And for uh, high to low, we do this. So this is equivalent to a pooling thing. Uh, we can also just be normal downsampling. Uh, this dimensionality, of course, is lower than this one. This is very important to note. Uh, and this one, this is a little bit tricky because, of course, this has to be an integer. So what we can either do is we can round it. Or we can uh, take the average of the four adjacent cells. Of course, we need the four because we are one octave lower, and it's 2D, so we need four cells. Um, the problem with just rounding is that your centers shift, and actually, the result is not correct because the pixels don't match anymore. So they don't do that. They use the average pooling. So this is sort of 
the core, I would say, of the paper is that we define this new convolution where we, and this is very important on the fly, because we don't need to do, what we can also do, of course, is that, uh, let's say, we have to go from low to high, then we can also just do an upsampling first and then add them together. But then we would use more memory because we need to store this new tensor. So the nice thing is that without using extra memory, we can do this, uh, this sort of upsampling operation. Um, yeah, and once we have this, then we can start implementing this and we can check a bit what will happen. So the memory cost is normal because of course, we divide by two and it's 2D. So the memory used should be a quarter of the original memory use, which is controlled, of course, by its alpha. It's also pretty straightforward. Computational cost, there's the derivation for it. The point is that, of course, because you actually store less data and you have less multiplications to do with your kernel, because for your high frequency part, it will only be one minus alpha and not one. So you get the second order. So the um, computational cost will become significantly lower. Uh, if you want to see how this is done, you can go into the appendix. It's quite trivial. So this is also not yeah, very insane, I think. Um, so we can see that theoretically, we should get some serious reduction in memory cost and in computational cost. Uh, for this calculation, we ignore the summations because they are really negligible because these are all um, the computational costs all second order here. So these, this sum is actually negligible and the pooling is also very small compared to the other uh, computational costs. Now, the results already. Um, so the results are actually pretty great. Uh, you can see here the figure is what I would focus on. So the dots in black is the baseline. Uh, and then for each uh, architecture, there's the alpha parameter, that's E. Uh, and you can see that it's clearly, so it's concave. Uh, well, the first thing you should see is that actually the accuracy is really quite high compared to the base. So if you look at the smaller net here even. Um, so that's very interesting. Um, you see that it's concave. So if you make your alpha too big, then of course, yeah, your your tensors will be so much reduced so much that you lose information or you lose way too much information so you can't make proper predictions anymore so that's why you see this sort of behavior everywhere uh, and then there's usually some sort of sweet spot you can see right 0 0.5 0 0.25 another important thing is that for the the flops this is logarithmic scale so you can see that it really uses less computational resources than the baseline so the accuracy is on average higher. They say, of course, it is because of the larger receptive field, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's concave, so there's some sort of sweet spot somewhere in the middle here. And you really see that, that the computational cost is a lot, lot lower. Okay, so then what they also did is they just expanded this on, uh, on a lot, a lot of models. And in general, the um, the memory cost really reduces by quite a bit. So for mobile nets by 34%, which is really nice because this is supposed to be uh, on infrastructure where there is not a lot of resources available. Uh, and then, yeah, you see for 26, uh, two thirds less flops than this one. Uh, and for even for very large models, there is a significant gain in um, computational speed, let's say, or just so in general, all these um, results are really very promising. The accuracy goes up significantly, there's a lot less memory usage, and the computational cost is a lot lower. And this is sort of the paper. This is uh, where it sort of ends. So this octave convolution, but maybe we should go back to it a bit. So this is really something quite simple, if you think about it. And it really gives really good results. Not only the fact that you lose a lot, use a lot less memory and you have to do fewer calculations, but also that your accuracy tends to improve. And yeah, that's basically it. Um, yeah, performance goes up, uh, less costly. That's pretty good. Are there, oh. Any downsides to the approach? 
Um, yeah, what the downsides are? Well, yeah, you need to um, you need to change your architecture a little bit, but otherwise, downsides not really. At least the, the paper doesn't mention any, uh, and I don't immediately see any. I don't know if you uh, if you have an idea. Feel free to share. But this looks like something that is uh, quite simple, and and the gains really make a lot of sense. So downsides, I would say no, not. Uh, Are there any other questions? Hey, um, I was just wondering, this is Karthik uh, from Austin. Uh, I was just wondering if um, specific kinds of images would produce a better result. Like for example, if you're just doing a simple yes, no class or good, bad class versus trying to do uh, you know, a thousand different uh, classes, does it uh, make a difference? Uh, well, that depends, of course, right? The, um, yeah, the, the, um, the gain is really is driven by these um, by this low frequency uh, convolution, but it doesn't it doesn't really, really, really make a difference. The only thing that makes a difference is that do you need these more um, these higher order features, let's say, so these features that are more about the general uh, pixels of the image, let's say, do you need them for classification or not? So whether it's a lot of classes or very few, it doesn't matter that much. It just, uh, it depends on the problem that you have. Okay, thanks. <laughs>